Hello, um, welcome back. Um, I'm today. I'm doing um, an episode on the porfiri porfiriato. Now, last time I uh, hinted at this through my videos that I will be talking about the um, the era of Porfirio Diaz. I will be talking about his era, not about the person himself, because you know that's a whole other thing for himself for you know another video. And I will be discussing his you know his uh, presidency or dictatorship, whatever you want to talk about it the Porfiriato, and it's order and progress. That was the main slogan for his, uh, for his rule. And you'll see here at the timeline, it's gonna, it's gonna generally it's seen as starting in 1876, although it's debatable as to, um, as you'll see in my slides, why it might be a little bit later. But if you were taking uh, 1876 as the uh, starting date to up to uh, 1911, where he uh, stepped down, or it was, you know, he, he stepped down. You'll see that the reign is going to be 35 years, which is going to be many, many decades in which Diaz will have practically uh, unrivaled power in Mexico. And his uh, era, the Por uh, Porfirieto, is going to be a major um, era in Mexican history. And, you know, yeah, let's get started. So first off, who's, who's in the president's chair before Diaz? It's going to be the liberals. You'll see on the right side on the screen, uh, it's going to be the liberals' uh, famous uh, and also Mexico's uh, arguably greatest president, uh, Juarez. And Diaz is um, he's a hero at this time from the Mexican uh, war against the French invaders, which I hope to cover one day. But he is the main uh, general who um, fought for Mexico. Uh, and he's, he's a good commander in a sense, Diaz. He's uh, very uh, out there. But after you know being a, a hailed as a glorious uh, hero from the war, what most uh, Mexican uh, generals do at this time is they uh, try to then go into politics to get power for themselves. So Diaz will run for presidency against a uh, long-standing Juarez, who has ruled Mexico for a lot a long time. You know, although and uh, his uh, his administration has been through a lot of things, but Juarez does not trust Diaz. Now, from what I can, what I, from what I can get, it's not really a, a personal distrust, but more of what Diaz represents. Juarez is a civilian. He has never, as far as I know, never uh, held a uh, command of troops and led uh, soldiers on the battlefield. He's a simple civilian who has, you know, a good, who is smart, who was raised in a good family, and you know, he just rose up to be presidency, right? Diaz is a general. You know, he has commanded men. He has the loyalty of his army, loyalty of other generals. And by becoming presidency, he's going to, uh, Diaz will indirectly represent the uh, historical um, events where generals um, come into office because they are heroes from, you know, wars. They come to office and possibly because, become, you know, a dictator, you know, kind of like the Roman Republic, the... Um, uh, Napoleonic era, you know, yeah. So D I think that's why Juarez doesn't trust Diaz, but he runs again, Juarez, and he beats Diaz. But Diaz uh, alleges fraud as a pretext for a rebellion because he is a um, Diaz. You have to know that at this time, Diaz is uh, he's still he's a middle aged general, right? And because he hopes to, you know, he has a good career so far because he hopes to become a presidency because Juarez swoops, uh, you know, doesn't step down and beats him in an election. Diaz will feel, you know, kind of a uh, smugged like Juarez intentionally, you know, doesn't want him to get power. So Diaz, he uh, goes um, into a rebellion. Now, rebellions in Mexico, um, in Spanish, they're called plan de something. There's going to be lots of plans in the in the beginning and around the beginning of the uh the 20th century and Diaz is lo launches his plan um plan de la noria however he underestimates how strong Juarez still is as a presidency Juarez is old but he has been through many experiences and you know his he has a, he still has a lot of loyalty from the army from the uh you know from the state you know so his first rebellion, Diaz fails against Juarez. But Juarez, because he's so old, he actually dies in office, leaving his uh, 
his buddy uh, Lerdo, a relatively unknown uh, liberal, but he's a civilian, you know, and he he's kind of what Juarez wanted. You know, he wants a civilian who doesn't have any uh, military uh, connections to take over office. So Lerdo comes in and he, he grants a general amnesty. This was a general thing. Uh, he grants an amnesty to uh, the conservatives, the clergy, even uh, Diaz who fought against the liberal governments because Laredo, he wants to start off in a, a clean slate, you know. Now Juarez accepts this uh, amnesty because, frankly, he was, you know, hiding in the mountains by the time Juar uh, Laredo came in. And Laredo, he, um, he's okay as a president. He's underrated, in my opinion, but he's okay in the sense he continues a liberal cause. You know, he enforces the laws against church, against, you know, separation of church and state, you know, land ownership, you know, all that. However, this kind of um, this is kind of my opinion. Uh, Laredo represents what was wrong with the Juarez regime, in which Juarez's presidency is that because he's a liberal, every uh, he's going to be you know have lo loyal allies and loyal friends and governments. But when he's gone, when Juarez dies, and Laredo, who's really unknown in history. When he comes in, he's not going to command the same amount of loyalty from the generals, from the, you know, administration that Juarez left behind, right? So he's okay. So Diaz decides to run again for presidency in the second election, but Laredo beats him, and uh, Diaz alleges fraud. Now, Laredo's second election creates a moment of weakness. Um, I forget how, but... It's kind of weird because Lerdo, he's he beats Diaz. It's fair, but Lerdo, who he doesn't get the you know overwhelming uh, support from the people. And Diaz, he is a hero of Mexico. He's a victorious general, you know. So he so the loyalty of Mexico is kind of split a little bit more evenly, but still in Lerdo's favor. So Diaz, he strikes. He launches his plan. Uh, de uh, Tuxtepec. Hopefully I know that. I don't know Spanish that well. And it's Diaz, uh, he's beating initially, but he, because he has the loyalty of the army far more than Lerdo, he comes back from the U.S. and his uh, plan continues, and he uh, eventually beats Lerdo. He becomes president in, in uh, 1876. Lerdo, uh, he flees to the U.S. So this is uh, Diaz's first uh, term. Um, it's relatively... Um, mainly about building foundations because he's a new of presence, but you know, presence can just magically change everything. They got to, you know, start setting up what they want to do. So first off, DS's first goal is to get recognition because he technically, technically did who a president to get the presidency. So he pays off the U S in, um, reparations or, uh, you know, concessions. I don't know. He pays them off somehow. And, for the U.S., Diaz takes the um, a unique turn in Mexican uh, cooperation, you know, in relations with the U.S. I forgot to put this in because you know, there's not that much space. But Diaz does something along the line of uh, along the line of um, what was it? Formal invasion, friendly invasion, whatever. His plan is to let the U.S. take over Mexico, not like militarily, but you know, more economically. Because he sees the U.S. as, you know, okay, our American uh, neighbors, they're going to, you know, be the top people in the Americas. Okay, it's going to be a struggle just to fight against them, you know, just to deny them any rights to our lands. But if we let them take over our resources, you know, invest with their, you know, American dollars, Mexico could, you know, benefit from this invasion, quote unquote. As the money coming in, we can use that to build, you know, infrastructure, you know, repay uh, debts and all that. And by letting the U.S. use our use uh, Mexico, we will Mexico we will become stronger through the you know the trade. So Diaz uh, he wants to establish future future cooperation through the with the U.S. through economics, because American dollars are very high, uh, highly valued and very, you know, important. And DS wants to make sure that the uh, economy, which I will get into in another slide, that it rebounds because at this stage, the economy is pretty much garbage. 
He also, uh, his regime has to also crush attempts by Laredo back in the, the U.S. to uh, retake Mexico, you know. He has to uh, crush these little incursions and, and, you know, uprisings to help uh, restore the liberals. And, you know, he does he does good in that. You know, he crushes Laredo's attempts. Laredo will never come back. He will die. Not sure in exile or, you know, in Mexico. I don't know. He dies. And he provides, uh, Diaz is very lucky. His regime comes in at, at comes in at the la- at the right time because Mexico, in context, it has been through so many civil wars and you know foreign invasions ever since independence. You know it hasn't really have a era of stability. You know, even in the Juarez regime, there were the conservatives, the French, the uh, Austrian, you know, imperials. You know, these uh, I think, yeah, and now Diaz. You know, so Diaz, his uh, presidency is. Very uh, peaceful and s- stable in a sense that there's no you know bl- wars or bloodshed here and there you know because I think in my opinion opinion uh, Mexico is pretty much tired you know its people have been through so much so when a dictator like a uh, uh, Diaz comes in you know he's still seen as a hero and a good man as a you know from the war against France so you know they might I think they might view the Diaz as okay. He's a dictator, but he's, you know, has a goodish reputation right now. And we don't want to spark another civil war because, you know, so many have died, you know. So let him, you know, stay in power. You know, there's not going to be any revolts or uprisings. And let's just see what he does, you know. And Diaz uh, completes his four-year administration, and it's pretty much okay, you know. Because it's not, you know, it's nothing special, but it's nothing great or nothing wor- bad either. So he steps down in four-year uh, uh, as presidency. As a president, as a president, and yeah, he steps down in 1880. However, he lets his ally Gonzalez take over. Now, Diaz's slogan to get the uh, election as presidency, or to you know make himself look more credible, is that he said no re-election, and he does so on his uh on his uh you know on his goal, but he lets his ally uh, General Gonzalez uh, take the presidency. Now, Gonzalez is weird. People might view him, view him as a puppet as Diaz. I would say no, because he was an ally of Diaz, but he's not really controlled by Diaz, you know? It's like in uh, the U.S. where the Democrats, you know, Obama and then Biden, you know? They're not puppets of each other. They're not, but they're allies, you know? They follow the same, you know, it's the same setting, you know? In this case, uh, Gonzalez, he's a general too. But he follows the strategy of uh, cooperation with the U.S. and its other neighbors, you know, mainly Europe. And unlike Diaz, he actually incorporates people from the previous administrations, such as the liberals and the conservatives, because the Diaz regime, uh, you know, because the way he got into the president's chair is because he had to overthrow the pres- uh, previous uh, liberals. So he incorporates uh, those people, Gonzalez. He also passed this new and modern land ownership laws. Now I forget how it how it happens, but he actually does it. Gonzalez he does a fairly good job of uh, being president. He modernizes Mexico, and he doesn't face any uh, unique opposition because he has, he's uh, he's generally liked by the by Mexican yes by Mexicans. And even though his government kind of spends a little bit too much, you know, but D is. He kind of, I think he kind of grew jealous of uh, Gonzalez because he got so, he was very liked by, by the people. And his administration is pretty independent, you know. It's kind of the first and, you know, the only, you know, administration during, during the Porfiri- Porfiriato where, you know, it's not really under Diaz's control, you know. He's just, see, he's an ally. It's linked, it's linked within the era because it's, you know, by, uh, de facto regime or de facto administration, you know? So hopefully, <laughs> yeah. But anyways, DAC doesn't like um, the ad attention that uh, Gonzalez gets from the Mexicans. So he decides, you know, just come back, you know, forget the uh, pre- uh, no reelection thing. So he changes the laws, run again. And the way he gets to be president is uh, he buys loyal- loyalists, from different classes, mainly the elites, you know, the, the top landowners, the uh, investors, you know. 
and he get he pays them off because his um at this time the foreign investments plan from the US and from Europe it actually raises a lot of funds for Mexico so he, he uses that to uh pay off the people and there's still a lot more to you know build build other buildings so at this point he effectively becomes dictator of Mexico well, with uh, rigged elections for many decades and yeah I won't go into do much, too much detail about the um the elections in between the years but just 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 uh it's they're all frauds you know Diaz he always wins and wins because he has people in the right place to give him the votes so this is um what I consider to be the official date of the Porfiriato although I can see why uh 1876 could be a good date but Gonzalez is it's really a a blank you know it's really a, a buffer between the first in the you know the first years of Diaz's regime so but yeah, you can still say 1876 is the main year, but I think this is where it really starts to be a dictatorship. So I'm not gonna talk about what happens in the years, but I'm gonna talk about I'm gonna talk about how um, the structures and plans of the uh, regime overall. So sorry if this is gonna be oversimplified or you know over uh, generalized info, but this is how I could really you know get it down. So for Diaz's uh, government. It's kind of like a authoritarian government. He um, he has all state governors report straight to Diaz. You know, not through any you know Congress or whatever. He has all his governors report to him. His legislation is formed out of allies and friends. You know, the loyalists he, who he uh, bought off and who he had uh, who he bought off and you know placed into the right positions to you know give him the right to basically basically do whatever he wants, any laws and you know elections and all that. And the way he does this is that it's kind of brilliant. Diaz is a, he's an excellent um, politician in the sense that he gets to, he knows how to manipulate the factions as the Los Scientificos, which are the scientists, the people who want to, you know, economics and, you know, modernization. Reyistas, who are the, basically the followers of some general uh, Reyes or something. And uh, pro-American uh, politicians who will uh, support co cooperation and, you know, favoritism towards uh, American investments. He knows how to play off uh, these factions off each other so that, you know, whatever defeats or wins they get, it's going to help Mexico and his plan, uh, Diaz's plan overall uh, as time progresses. So, so Diaz doesn't really have all the power, but he just knows how to wield power, you know? So that's why I think, in my opinion, this is he's a far, far better dictator than uh, Santa Ana, who I hope to uh, do a report on one day. Now, first off, he uh, Diaz takes a we his relation with the church is weird. The church has been very discredited discredited at this period of time because it threw in its it threw in its lot with the conservatives, who threw in their lot with the French, and uh, because they lost. They're deemed as traitors, all of them. Now, the church was very harassed and um, attacked by the liberals because of the whole separation of church and state. And when Diaz uh, takes over, they don't know what to do with him. However, Diaz, uh, because he's a Diaz is a, a liberal general, but it's more de facto in my opinion. And his administration is very weird in, in the sense that it doesn't really do anything. It doesn't really attack the church but it, is, it doesn't really let them have any more, have uh, their old power over the uh, government, you know? So he lets church alone. So what happens is that the church, um, because it's not being attacked anymore, it can finally, you know, rebound and improve its relations with the mainly peasants and, you know, Metzko. And what happens is that it'll start, it won't have any, you know, any, um, strong political power to uh uh you know a threat to the Aces regime but it will have a huge sway because they have a huge a huge uh, influence now they will actually you know start liking Diaz you know because they know that Diaz he's an opportunity to you know reconcile with the uh Mexicans who view them as traitors so when the uh, revolution uh you know spoiler alert when the revolution uh, pops up uh later in the regime the church will actually be a, a strong, um, a strong uh, ally of the Diaz regime, 
And curiously, uh, when some of the peasants who join into the revolution, when the civil wars break out, you know, spoiler alert, they will, um, some of the civil wars are because the peasants of the revolution are very swayed by the church, you know? So the church will have a, finally have enough influence to sway uh, factions and a lot of people after, you know, during the Diaz regime and after it falls. Now, land ownership, this is going to be a major factor in uh, why the revolution sparks off. Now, land estates or uh, asientas are run by um, wealthy landowners. However, Diaz, is, uh, he chooses to buy off those landowners to be loyalist to his regime. And to buy them off, he lets, he, you know, buys them off, right? But he also lets them do whatever they want to give their, uh, he makes, um, in his uh, regime, uh, peasants and indigenous people who have rights to lands are brushed aside. Now, those people, those lower classes, they have uh, documents from um, the colo colonial period, you know, from Spain that say, you know, they have ownership over these lands. But Diaz, uh, he says, you know, I eh, forget it, you know, no, the people who own the lands are the people who are running them right now, which are the rich people, you know. So those papers and documents are brushed aside, and that's how they, uh, uh, he, that's how Diaz transfers those lands to his allies, you know. And those, some of those allies happen to include foreign investors, uh, mainly Americans on large scale. So mainly like um, like coal, like resource, you know, like food farms, uh, natural resource sites, you know. And I think later in a report, 90% uh, are going to be directly under, 90% of natural resources in Mexico will be uh, directly um, under the Americans. But yeah, uh, the lower classes, had, uh, as a result, they suffer uh, economically and politically because they, uh, you know, if you're a peasant with no power, Diaz is not going to care about you, you know. He wants to care about those people with money and power. So I'll talk about the... Uh, re uh, repercussions as a whole later on. Wait, did I? Uh, okay. So the military and state police. Uh, Diaz is a general, so he um he decides to um you know he he knows that Mexico is kind of behind, so he modernizes uh the army among European lines. He increases the the budget of the army, and you know equipment is enhanced. He has he increases the budget because this time you know. Mexico is making a lot of money from all these those investments. However, curiously, uh, you know, he shrinks the federal army to twenty five men. Uh, they are well trained. Well, they are well equipped, but they are they will suffer from low morale because they are conscripts. You know, people forced to fight for Diaz, and this will be a major factor in how the revolution, you know, uh, sparks off. However, the main um, the main arm iron fist of uh, Diaz and his regime is the, uh, in my opinion, the rural police, the rurales. Now, the rural police are uh, basically state police um, who are trained to crack down on regional revolts. You know, because Diaz isn't he doesn't want uh, uprising in you know in one state to spread to multiple states. You know, because he knows that he's you know starting to you know he might you know piss off other people. So he wants to make sure that, you know, people, those, they won't get, get so far, you know, and he wants to crack on them, like, like, just like that. And yeah, they take over a social order, the, the state police, and effectively for the peasants and lower classes, Diaz's regime will be uh, like a state, like a state, a police state, you know, like North Korea, where if you say anything or, you know, go against Diaz or fight against him, you'll be crushed, like, just like that. So his whole regime is based on fear and for the lower classes, for uh, for the economy. So as I said, the economy is, was pretty much in bad shape. Juarez, uh, I would say he, it's because it's the liberals were uh, unlucky. They got invaded by France. The conservatives were uh, waged war, guerrilla wars, you know. And, you know, the economy as a whole wasn't doing so good because, you know, people were fighting and dying. But because he is... Uh, He's lucky in a sense that his he has a lot of peace and stability in Mexico. Uh, Diaz, uh, you know, his plan is to favor investments to get the money in and private privatization. 
And um, it's key to note that private uh, privatization is um is very um it's very emphasized because they're this is gonna be a major factor in uh why they're um how the Americans got so much land in Mexico. Privatization is um unregulated, you know. Diaz he favors foreign investments, but he allows it to spread to the point of um the U.S. will have a lot of lands under their rule. And I forget the, the statistics, but I think somewhere, um, not to Americans, but to investors as a whole, they will own more than 50% of Mexico, but that's very debatable. But it's a huge percent of land but under you know investors that you know Mexico does not own. So you can say Diaz is you know, selling off Mexico to the uh, foreigners in this you know, f- uh, friendly invasion, quote-unquote but they do make results and the economy as a whole rises comparable to European powers. So that's a lot of money. And this will be the golden age for the peso, the Mexican currency. So $3.2 per Mexico, I mean, per, per uh, peso, because, you know, th- this investment, it's very uh, opportunistic and very, you know, very, uh, very interesting, you know, because investors, they are very favored and they will have no, you know, regulations telling them, telling them what to do and when, what, what not to do, you know. And as a result, uh, Diaz, he buys off his loyalists, right? But he also uses the mon- funds to fund um, constructions of the railways and all that, buildings and, buildings and landmarks, you know. And he practically uh, modernizes Mexico. He uh, industrializes it, you know. And you'll see these uh, railways and these all these uh, new ways of communication. They will be they will be very vital in the uh, revolution and the uh, civil wars that follow afterwards. The culture, so the DS regime. If you want a snapshot picture of it, you'll just see a picture of an elite, because they are the main you know bread breadwinners of the of the regime. You know, you can picture them as fancy clothing to represent the uh, modernity and really much there are new powers under Diaz, you know. French culture is introduced because, you know, Diaz uh, adopted new relations with France, you know, new, uh, better relations after their invasion. Uh, Horse racing, all these uh, fancy things, um, all these events and, you know, utilities, they will be... um, they're showing that Mexican society, it's not, it's changing, you know? Mexican society is changing and it's not stuck in the, you know, peasant uh, agricultural, you know, uh, norm that was a few years ago, you know? So Diaz, uh, he is re- uh, representing uh, change, debatable if that's good or bad, you know? So yeah. Now let's talk about the iffy things. So all these economic uh, opportunities I, I was talking about, they are only reserved for the, the elites and the investors. Peasants, lower classes, mestizos, descalzos, people who don't have any, you know, clothes or, you know, shoes. They lose lands. They lose power and influence to the rich landowners and foreign investors. And it borders on feudalism in the sense where peasants and farmers who are working on lands Those lands don't belong to them, you know? They are working off for some guy in his, you know, rich mansion, his haciendas, you know? And that, you know, kind of represents, like, you know, peasants working for a noble whose lands that they own, but, you know, they allow those peasants to work on. The media is suppressed by the regime because, yes, D is, you know, he did seize power, rule with the iron fist, you know? So the media is going to be shut down. And all those grievances by the peasants in the uh, lower classes, they are put aside, you know. This will be a major factor on why so many people join the revolution is because, in my opinion, the main weakness of a weakness of a Jesus regime is that he favors the top 1%, you know, the rich people, right? But he doesn't do anything to help the uh, lower classes, you know. He just keeps attacking them and attacking them to the point where they're, you know, to the point where if, uh, you know, if a person calls for an uprising, you know, a good one, you know, a well broadcasted broadcasted uprising, a lot of peasants may just join that, you know. The ruralists, uh, the the state police, they will suppress regional dissent and keep peasants in place, you know. So there are like a dissent in the Mexico, you know. It's not all peace, but you know, it's 
generally a good piece um, in Mexican history. But you know, there's still uprisings here and there. But the Raleys are suppressing those. Um, they are suppressing those revolts really uh, fairly fairly well. But that builds off fear and you know paranoia in the lower classes. You know, and the Raleys they can only do so much. You know, they are like compared to the population like what like one percent. You know. So you can only keep the peasants in place out of fear and brutality for so long until they, you know, until there's a weakness in the government and until, you know, until, you know, the cracks just might overflow. Now let's talk about those cracks. Now, 1898 is when I see the uh, regime uh, relatively weakening. Uh, sorry about this picture, but it's a picture of uh, Diaz and uh, the U.S. President, uh, William Taft. But 1980, uh, oh, I messed that up too. 1898, sorry. Mateus Romero, uh, Diaz's longtime political uh, political ally, he dies. And he's the leader of that pro American faction I talked about. And that faction is going to be too weak to continue without him. So uh, as a result, you know, investment towards uh, American investment, it's not going to be very, you know, favored favoritized, you know, very light as before. But the Americans at this point, they have so much money and, and you know, uh, economic uh, stakes within Mexico that they have to support Diaz because, you know, there's just so much money to made, to be had in Mexico that even the faction, you know, Diaz government doesn't like them as much. They're still profiting off that, so. And you'll see this is why uh, Taft, he still supports... Uh, he still supports um, relations with Diaz's government. So, but Diaz is a man, and like all people do, he is um, growing old, and his regime is uh, like Juarez's government. It becomes linked to him. So if he dies, there's no telling what could happen to his regime because you know those loyal loyalists, they're only loyal to Diaz. You know, investors, they're. Uh, they're friends of Diaz, you know, but if there's someone new to take over, um, like, for example, Francisco Madero, a new reformist elite, there's no telling what could happen, you know. So I talked about investments. Uh, yeah, so the so Mexico will start to favor European investment over the U.S., but, you know, the U.S. Has, still has many investments and, you know, too many investments to just abandon the regime. So it'll still support Diaz. But yeah, new uh, uh, reformist elites like Francisco Madero. Um, well, look, you know, they think it's going to be their time to take over, you know, pow for take over power, you know, in Mexico, because Diaz is very old. I think he's like at this point. You know, let me just. So wait, eighteen ninety ninety eight minus eighteen thirty, which one? Which was uh, when he was born? Yeah, he's like 88, uh, 68 at this point, you know, 1898. Diaz is like 68 years old. So he's pretty up there, you know. So people are expecting him to, to you know, to step down. Well, but spoiler alert, he will not step down. And this will be the collapse, in my opinion, of the Diaz regime. So Diaz decides to run again in 1910. So pretty fairly late, you know. And he... Uh, he rigs the election and Madero, um, because Diaz tried to cooperate with Madero prior, he tried to figure out what Madero was trying to do. And Madero was a uh, very reformist and all that. But Diaz, for some reason, he decides to run in 1910. I think uh, we don't know why, but I think it's relatively uh, because um, 1910 was the year that the, uh, it's it's curious. I think it's not the the year that uh, Mexico got, Something to do with the uh, um, Hidalgo, you know. But he decides to run in 1910. He wins the election. It's a fraud election, and he turns he turns against Madero. He forces Madero to flee to the U.S. And from uh, his from the U.S., uh, Madero uh, he's going to be the first major elite to launch a plan against Diaz, the plan de San Luis Pot Potosi. And because he's an elite. And because all those peasants are, you know, at this point, very furious with the Diaz regime, there will be many uh, revolts that spring up in Mexico. 
And remember that the Federal Army is 25,000 men. They are too weak and too small to contain them. And those armies um, and the Federal Army, they suffer from lower morale. So in some cases, the revolts actually beat the uh, army in some battles. And many battles are taken, you know. And in this case, uh, the, the city of uh, Ciudad Juarez is taken. And with so many major cities being taken by these rebels, Diaz is forced to resign because at this point he's too old to really fight for anything, you know. And, you know, in 1910, in 1911, uh, he's granted a, a very favorable uh, settlement in which he's allowed to live and allowed to go into exile. And Madero, he actually grants a general amnesty to all the Diaz uh, factions, Diaz uh, supporters. And um, we'll talk about why that is a huge uh, error, you know. But that's for another story, you know. So, yeah, so 1911 minus 1830. Diaz is 81 years old in 1911. So he's pretty much too weak to be president, you know. He's very old. So he actually dies in Paris in 1915. And, you know, while he's in Paris, Metzko's revolution under Madero, it falls apart and it uh, falls apart into many civil wars. Uh, I, would I would like to talk about the um, Mexican revolution in, in another video, but yeah. Um, there's a reason why Diaz's regime was... Uh, in my, my opinion, it's very peaceful or, you know, quote unquote, peaceful and stable because unlike the revolution, it won't have a lot of, you know, it won't have a lot of wars here and there, you know, people being toppled and all that. And the following uh, revolution after Diaz's uh, uh, fall from power, it will have uh, millions of deaths in its uh, time period. So, yeah, but that's a whole nother video, you know. So I want to talk about the legacy of the Porfiriato. Now, once again, it's a major peace, probably the first general peace since independence, you know. Santa Ana, he failed. Um, Juarez, he was unlucky, many wars here and there, but his re Diaz's regime came at the right place at the right time, you know, and it gave a, me a Mexico a uh, sense of stability, and the economy under that stability rose. It rose uh, to a historic high mark, you know, Kind of like uh, like Cuba, it gave a lot of uh, emphasis on the economy and uh, in this case for private privatization. And you know the peso was very you know valued, you know, and all that money that came in was that um, modernization, you know, the railways, industrialization. Mexico finally moved forward, you know, as for once it got a chance to move forward, you know. However, progress meant being left behind, and the resentment of the lower classes and uh, the peasants who made up a lot of the country, most of the country, right? It led to the other major uh, major um, era since uh, after Diaz, which is the revolution period, you know? So Mexico, from the independence war, from Santa Ana's period, you know, Juarez's period, Porfi uh, Diaz's period, you know, the revolution is the next major event in Mexican history because... Diaz, you know, that feudalism-ish uh, Asienta regime he had. Those peasants will revolt, right? But this will not be a rebellion. This will be a revolution where they try to, many people will try to topple the society that Diaz will build. It's arguable in whether they will um, succeed, in my opinion, but whole another video for a whole another day. Now, for the man himself, Diaz, it's hard to tell whether he was a, for his administration, it's hard to tell whether um, it was good or bad. From a perspective like mine, you know, like I'm, a, uh, I'm not that, my family's not that rich. It's kind of in the barely, barely middle class, you know. And my, you know, if I was like, you know, in, if, if I was living in Mexico, you know, they would not value me, you know. They would just give power to the people like, um, what, like in this case, Jeff Bezos, um, the guy who owns uh, Facebook, you know, politicians, you know, all that, you know. They would not care about the lower classes like me, you know. However, for, for progress in terms of Mexico as a whole, because of the because the economy rose so highly, 
you you get to see all these, you know, new um, buildings and equipment, you know. So it's very debatable whether the regime was uh, good or bad. Uh, I would say um, morally it was bad, horrible. <laughs> but for progress, you can say the regime was pretty uh, good because Juarez's regime, um, it was only good in the sense that it wrote many uh, modern and very historical laws. But in terms of progress, it wasn't really that good, you know, because, you know, invasions here and there. Uh, Santa Ana was a disaster, as I said, you know utter failure but Diaz he actually got stuff done he really modernized Mexico he um he had good relations with the U.S. you know and with the world as a whole you know he got Mexico very high in prestige in terms of you know economic um value uh compared to you know to, to Europe so he made Mexico pretty much the um, a powerful country but it wasn't it was powerful in the sense of money, but it wasn't powerful in the sense of, you know, a uh, union and, you know, um, general uh, like of the regime. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I might talk more, more about uh, Diaz as a person later on because his life and his upbringing, you know, it helps ex explain, you know, how he became a natural hero, you know, but his regime is really, um, you cannot deny the... Um, it's very, um, it's not just a total, you know, di dictator evil regime. It has many perks to it, you know, and by knowing what it did, you can, you can, you know, you can understand why the revolution popped up or, you know, or why, uh, there was a, such a need to, um, uh, you know, why his regime was pretty much peaceful and how, you know, it came at the right time once again, as I said, but yeah. That is the story of the Porfiriato and um, why it's a major influence on uh, French society to this day. And Diaz is uh, its greatest, Mexico's greatest dictator. He had a lot of skill in uh, his, he had a firm grand, a firm hand, you know. As I said, uh, somewhere between uh, 19, 1898, he was very old, 68, but. I think as time wore on, um, Diaz, even though he had a strong hand because he was growing, growing old and, you know, circumstances uh, kept changing, mainly the uh, descent in the lower classes of Mexico. I think as the regime went on that as uh, Diaz got older, his regime got, you know, weaker. So I think his main mistake, in my opinion, if he ever, is re if his regime would, you know, if he wanted to end regime, his regime uh, re relatively good, he should have not been, uh, he should have not ran for election in 1910, but that's a whole nother story for a whole nother day. Um, I hope to talk about his uh, life one day or the revolution in Mexico one day, but I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, I might talk about the Mexican ex expedition, but yeah. So expect more videos about uh, history in the Americas, uh, not about the Americans because overrated. <laughs> but yes, uh, Orva. And um, yeah. Uh, I might talk about uh, that uh, Marshall, uh, Marshall uh, Bezain. Um, who knows? So uh, thank you for watching. And um, thank you for watching. And uh, hope to, uh, you know, yeah.